This video is going to focus on the balance sheet, one of uh, four common uh, financial statements used in all uh, large organizations. Uh, while I'm going to focus on the balance sheet here, I've already done a video focusing on the statement of operations or the income statement. Uh, and I'll be doing one more video looking at some sample ratios used for ratio analysis. Um, so to remember uh, very briefly, financial statements are used to communicate the overall health of an organization to external parties, uh, including the board, uh, lenders, uh, or, and or investors. Um, again, four common statements, the income statement, the balance sheet, statement of cash flows, and statement of changes in equity. Uh, we're going to focus in again on this uh, in here on the balance sheet. Um, and uh, if you would like to see the income statement, you can, uh, there's a link in the, in the notes here to get there. There's also a link in the notes to, that you can download this, uh, 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 <laughs> this uh, uh, spreadsheet with the statement of operations, the balance sheet, and the ratios that I've worked out so that you can follow along uh, or mess around with it. Now, as I said in the previous video, the data in this video is from a real health system, a real non-for-profit health system. It includes a not-for-profit hospital, a multi-specialty physician group, a VNA, uh, as well as a uh, uh, real estate holding company and probably a couple of other cats and dogs. Uh, but what we're seeing here is the consolidated balance sheet. So like the other, other video, I talked about the consolidated statement of operations. So this actually represents multiple organizations kind of rolled up in, in, you know, to the parent organization. Okay, that all said, let's explore uh, the balance sheet. So again, what I said in the prior video, uh, these are standardized statements within a range, right? They're done uh, using generally accepted accounting principles, uh, following very specific rules. Now, there's some flexibility in how things are actually put in here, but an auditor, ha these are all audited. Um, and so an external auditor, uh, an expert in accounting has to look at these and say, yeah, the judgments you, the organization made, uh, make sense to me. I believe they are, in, you know, in accordance with uh, generally accepted accounting principles uh, for the type of organization that you are. Uh, and I was saying, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Also, this organization, like I said, is a is, this data is real data, and I downloaded it from the internet. I'm not using the actual organization's name, uh, but you can probably find it or figure out what what it is. Um, but it is real and. If you kind of get a handle on how a balance sheet works uh, for a healthcare organization, if you pull down the financial statements for Coca-Cola or General Electric or any other large you know, publicly traded company or any company that produces financial statements, you're going to see an income statement that looks just like, well, not just like, but very similar to the one we just worked on. You'll see a, they have a balance sheet that looks very much like this one. They'll also have a cash flow and a, a statement of um, that changes in, in owner's equity. So all that said, let's look at the balance sheet. All right. So like before, I want to do a quick kind of run through of the balance sheet kind of structure because there's a common structure. Um, and then we'll get into the details, kind of the nitty gritty of, of, of the, um, uh, of this particular balance sheet. So a balance sheet is, comes in, in two parts. Um, typically you'll see them with a, you'll either see them left and right, or in this case, we're going to have it vertically, but it's, it's two parts. Uh, I like to kind of think of it like, a, I like to put it on, like if I'm writing this on a chalkboard, I like to put it left and right because the balance sheet uh, has to balance, hence the name. So it's kind of like if you imagine one of those old fashioned scales where you have, you know, some weights on one side and you have whatever it is you're weighing on the other side, you know, like the Statue of Liberty holding up, you know, her, her the scales of justice. Um, uh, a balance sheet, both sides, right, both ha halves of the uh, balance sheet have to be equal. And so we'll go through that in a second. But the left side, or in this case, the first part of the balance sheet is the asset section um, of the balance sheet. And in the asset section, we deal with all the stuff that the organization has. So imagine you're driving down the street 
um, and you, you know, you and your, your spouse are driving down the street and you look off on the side and you see a house that you really like and you're like, Oh, I wonder how much that house has cost, you know? And so you, you know, your, your spouse says, well, you don't have to wonder, take out your phone. Um, and so, uh, my spouse says that to me all the time. And, uh, um, uh, so you take out your phone, you pull up Zillow and you type in the address and the, you know, Zillow comes back and says that house has a market value of $500,000. Well, basically what you've just found out is that asset, the house, is, you know, is worth $500,000. Um, and so that is the value of the stuff, right? So that, that house, um, you know, uh, what I like to say about assets are you can touch them, you can sell them, or you can spend them. Uh, I think that's pretty comprehensive. You can touch it, sell it or spend it. If you can touch it, sell it or spend it, it's probably an asset. Um, and then you go down here uh, to this next section. So that's the assets. So they have in this organization, they have total assets in 2017 of $389,398,345. Then the other half, so this would be if I was doing this uh, side by side, um, the right side of the balance sheet, if you will, or in this case, the, the lower half of the balance sheet, is, is the liabilities and net assets um, of the organization. Uh, in for-profit speak, it would be liabilities and owner's equity. And I'm going to be honest with you, I slip back into that um, because saying net assets always throws me off. Um, but formally for a not-for-profit entity, it's liabilities and net assets. So here I want to make a point. Total assets here, right? total assets are 389 million. And if we scroll down to the bottom here, ooh, what do we find? Total liabilities and net assets or total liabilities and owner's equity uh, is also $389,398,345. Uh, $389, That's a lot of threes in there. Um, so they're equal, right? Total liabilities and net assets is equal to total assets, and it has to be. And why does it have to be? So you're just looking at that five hundred thousand, that lovely five hundred thousand dollar house. Um, uh, you know, you and your spouse are looking at, and uh, you know, Zillow will tell you how much the asset is worth, but Zillow, as far as I know, is not going to tell you whether the family that lives in that house owns that house outright. If they've got a mortgage and that more or and how much or or if they have a mortgage and how much that mortgage is right, so they might own you know they might be just very well off maybe they've lived there a really long time and they've paid off their mortgage, and so their net assets or their equity in the house right you've probably heard the phrase equity, right their equity in the house is equal to the value of the house, so if they don't have a mortgage on the house the value of their equity, or if they were a not-for-profit company, their net assets would be equal to the total assets. See, that's why I don't like the phrase net assets. But their, their equity would be equal to their total assets. So if, if, they, if this health system had no liabilities, no loans, no bonds, um, that, and, and no short-term liabilities, uh, its uh, net assets would equal its total assets. So it would be 389 million. Um, but except for the very few of us who can afford to pay off our house, uh, most of us carry a mortgage. So let's imagine that this family that lives there has a mortgage worth $400,000. So we know that the house is worth $500,000. They have a $400,000 mortgage, which means they're financing 80% of the value of the house. Well, what's left is their net assets or their equity, right? That the other $100,000, so there's the $400,000 bank loan, and then 100,000 of that is the equity of the family, or if it was a non-for-profit company, we'd call that the net assets, right? So, 400 plus 100 equals 500. So the asset, the $500,000 house, has to equal the total of the liabilities, in this case, the mortgage, the $400,000 mortgage, plus whatever, and then whatever's left over uh, uh, after the mortgage 
is the equity of the owners. And so this very much works the same way. If you can kind of keep that in your head, that when we're talking about assets, that's like the house, the market value of your house. And then we're down here we're looking at liabilities and owner's equity or liabilities and net assets. We're looking at, you know, the liability section is like the mortgage on your house and the net assets, net assets section is your, um, your equity. Now, this would look a little different if we were looking at a, a for-profit and maybe I'll post a, an addendum at some point looking specifically at the equity portion of, of a balance sheet for a for-profit company. Um, but down here we would have uh, common stock and um, retained earnings, but we'll leave that for now and just focus in on uh, a the not-for-profit structure. Okay, so what I want to do now is kind of drill into the asset section. And then after that, we'll go back down to the second half of the balance sheet, which is the uh, liabilities and net assets or liabilities and owner's equity. Okay, so in the asset section of the balance sheet, we break the assets into two parts. We have current assets and non-current or long-term assets. So Here's our, this is our list of current assets. So what is a current asset? We're going to talk about current assets. We're talking about things that we, ex we could use or expect to use within a year. So cash and cash equivalent. So cash is something we could use immediately, right? Because it's cash. Cash we can take out and we can walk down the street and buy ourselves a Starbucks coffee or, or a Dunkin' Donuts coffee or uh, whatever, whatever your preference is. Um, so we can use that immediately. So that is less, you know, immediately is less than one year. Um, cash, so cash, we talk, we're talking about literally cash in the safes in your organization, right? So the dining facility probably has some cash and your different practices might have a little bit of cash on hand. Um, but, but most of our cash is actually in cash equivalents, which is the checking accounts that the organization uses. Then you have short-term investments. So your, you know, your checking accounts and certainly the cash in your safe don't earn any interest. Well, you don't want to have, you want to have as little uh, cash tied up in non-interest bearing instruments as you possibly can. So you just want enough to be able to kind of pay your bills because otherwise you want that money to be working for you. And so uh, organizations will take, excuse me, will take um, uh, their cash that they don't need for immediate uh, use and they'll put it into short-term investments. So those could be anything from, you know, certificates of deposit to T-bills to whatever. And basically short-term investments are easily converted into cash uh, or converted, you know, into your checking account, but they're not actually in your checking account. Uh, so uh, again, that would, but, but because they're so easy to convert into cash, they are considered a current asset, right? Because you can have ask, access to that spending power within a year, or you expect to be able to have access to it within a year. So cash in and cash equivalents, short-term assets, both current are both categorized as current assets. The next line here is accounts receivable net of allowance for doubtful accounts. So when a patient comes in to see, uh, to get a procedure done in your hospital, typically they'll, um, they're not going to pay the full amount uh, the day that they have the procedure done. They might pay you some small percentage in uh, uh, of, of the uh, bill uh, the day of by paying you a copay or some coinsurance, so maybe 20 bucks. Let's imagine that they have, um, I, I think I used, yeah, I used the example last time of, a, a, they have a you know, net of, uh, uh, their insurance company says the allowable bill here is $150. And so they pay you a $20 copay uh, day of, and then you're going to bill the insurance company for $130, right? The net uh, difference there, right? They paid you, the bill's 150, they paid you 20 in cash day of, there's still $130 outstanding. So you send that bill off to uh, the insurance company and that becomes an account receivable, meaning we're expecting to get 
that $130 from the insurance company eventually. Now, we talked in the income statement portion that um, not everybody winds up paying their bills. Uh, so typically, uh, this is in particular for individuals who, you know, might not pay for their uh, care day of, um, but we send it, you know, we send them a bill and they don't have health insurance. And so uh, maybe they don't pay. So we captured that here in the provision for bad debts. Um, and here, right, what we're going to report is we're reporting here 27 million. Um, so there's actually some amount larger than that that the organization is carrying in terms of accounts receivable, but they've booked um, based on the income, what was written on the income statement, they've booked an allowance for doubtful accounts, right? That's the uh, provision for bad debts becomes the allowance for doubtful accounts over here on the balance sheet. And so when we take the total amount that we build out, that's our, our gross accounts receivable. And then we reduce that amount by the allowance for doubtful accounts, the amount that we allowed for over on the, on the uh, statement of operations. And that gives us a net uh, accounts receivable of $27 million. So that's the amount that we think we are actually going to be able to collect at some point. So these are basically the accounts receivable is a bunch of IOUs, right? So somebody owes this organization $27 million. Actually, somebody owes them more than that. Um, I think it's like, I think they were netting out like $15 million that they didn't think they were ultimately going to collect. So it's really like $42 million they're owed, but they really only think they're going to collect 27 million. It's kind of like, you know, I loan, lend, loan uh, my buddy 10 bucks. I figure he's really only going to give me $7 back eventually. Right? So that's kind of what this is. So it's an asset. It's a current asset because the accounts receivable are continuously being paid off um, and they're continuously being added to, right? So you go to the, you go to get a procedure, right? Your $150 procedure, uh, you submit, uh, your you submit um, your uh, bill or, or the in, uh, the hospital submits the bill to the insurance company and then 30 days later or 40 days later the insurance company actually pays the hospital and so that hundred and thirty dollars that that was in the accounts receivable goes to zero because the um, insurance company paid the hundred and thirty dollars and so cash goes up by hundred and thirty dollars and the accounts receivable goes down or down by $130. But in the meantime, the hospital's seen, you know, a thousand more patients who all also have, you know, $130 bills uh, that have to be sent out. So uh, it's a continuously, you know, continuously emptying and filling. It's kind of like, imagine your bathtub uh, and you've got the spigot on and you're pouring water into your bathtub, but at the same time, you've pulled out the drain plug so that there's water going out. So the accounts receivable is kind of always fluctuating. There's always some there's always some money in the accounts receivable that's being collected, kind of like there's always water in your bathtub if you're doing this. But depending on how fast you've got the water turned on to pump in and how big your uh, your drain is as to how what level of water there is in your tub. And it's kind of the same for the accounts receivable. It depends on how much money, you know, how many bills are coming in and then how many bills are being paid off as to how big your account receivable is. The next item, so, so it's a current asset because it's continuously being paid off. Typically, you know, you're going to have a days in accounts receivable, something like, uh, you know, 45 days. Um, so average, you know, average amount, amount of time that, that an accounts receivable lives in your organization is somewhere, you know, around there. Um, then you have inventories. Inventories are, uh, you know, it's just stuff you have on hand that you're going to use to provide, uh, to provide the services that you provide. So it's going to be, um, the bandages that you have in your warehouse, the syringes, the um, pharmaceuticals, all the orthopedic screws and plates that your your surgeons are going to use, all that stuff sits in inventory. So, so this organization has three point six million dollars in inventory um, on hand. Uh, and something I should say is the balance sheet is a snapshot in time. 
So the balance sheet, and I should have said that at the beginning, the balance sheet is a snapshot in time. It's, it's all these things are a balance on a given day, you know, so probably December 31st of 2017, for example, right? Kind of like if you look at um, uh, uh, your bank statement, it's your bank statement is going to be your balance in your bank account at any given time. Um, but it doesn't include stuff like checks outstanding, uh, things like that. So, uh, you know, and it doesn't, it doesn't count. It doesn't care what it was yesterday or the fact that you took out, you know, half your money two days ago. Uh, it's just what it is right now. Okay. So inventory, you know, they've got $3.6 million in inventory on hand right now, but inventory, you know, this organization uses, $109 million in supplies. So at any given time, maybe they only have, you know, $4 million in inventory on hand, but that's cycling through really fast, right? So if they've got $4 million in inventory, they, they cycle that inventory through 25 times because 25 times four is 100 million. So um, at any given time, they've got a little less than 4 million in inventory on hand, um, but they're cycling it through. So another example of a current asset. The other reason it's a car, inventories are a current asset is if you had to, you could sell your inventory. You could either return it back to uh, your supplier or you could sell it on the market. Uh, likewise, with accounts receivable, you can actually, there are firms that will, will uh, buy your accounts receivable from you. It's called factoring. And then they'll collect the, um, the accounts for you. Well, not for you. They'll collect it for themselves. Um, so that's also possible. Uh, part of why it's it's regard, uh, accounts receivable are regarded as a current asset. Um, prepaid expenses and other current uh, assets. So um, a prepaid expense is something uh, that you've paid for uh, but haven't used up yet. So imagine um, you. Uh, uh, bought a two-year subscription to uh, National Geographic, and you are trying to capture how much value is left on your subscription to National Geographic, and you've gone one year into your two-year subscription for National Geographic, and just for simple numbers, let's imagine that you paid $20 for a two-year subscription to National Geographic. Well, you've used up $10 of it. If you're one year into your two-year subscription, you used up $10 of it, but you have $10 in value still uh, for your prepaid, right? your, your, um, your subscription, right? Because you've still got another year left. And so you can do that uh, with things like insurance. You can prepay insurance. You can prepay rent. You can prepay a lot of things that then roll over, over from you know, this year to next year. So maybe they paid a year's rent on a piece of equipment in December, on December 1st of 2017. Uh, and now it's, it's December 31st. Well, they have 11 months of prepaid rent left uh, as of December 31st. And so that's what would roll into this account. And then uh, current portion of funds held by trustee under revenue bond. Um, so this is a little bit complicated, but basically uh, they have some some uh, cash that, that has been kind of earmarked uh, to cover uh, payments that are due on their bonds. And so that's a current asset in the sense that it's going to be used this year uh, to pay off what they owe, but you know it's actually not really available to the organization except in the sense that they're going to use it to pay off their bills. So we add up our current assets right here. So we add all these up. And that adds up to $95 million. Well, remember, they have $389 million. So the rest of the uh, 389, so $95 million of the $389 million is current assets. The rest are long-term or non-current assets. So our next, our first non-current asset are investments limited as to use. Investments limited as to use refers to uh, uh, investments uh, that the organization has made and the board has decided that these are, uh, we're setting those aside for
for a specific purpose. Um, the board can allow allow management to spend that money if if the board sees fit uh, to do so, but um, that money is is temporarily uh, set aside. So it's not the same thing, and we're going to come back to that down here in a minute. But it's not the same thing as temporarily restricted. Temporarily restricted, uh, which I talked about in the statement of operations, is restricted by the donor. Here, typically, most of this, at least, is going to be. Uh, uh, some of it is going to be permanently, you know, is going to be restricted. Um, uh, these here, but it doesn't. Uh, uh, the temporarily restricted assets, but this is not going to add up. The temporarily and permanently restricted is not going to add up to the 184 million, as you can see. Um, so some of that is just simply the the board has said we're setting aside these resources for future investments, such as replacing our our, our building. Then we have um, funds set aside for professional liability uh, claims, and so here we have. Uh, uh, assets or, or, or cash that's been set aside because we know as a healthcare organization, sooner or later, we're going to get sued. Um, so this is money that's been set aside to cover that. Net PPE is refers to net property, plant, and equipment. Uh, and I talked about property, plant, and equipment when I, talk, uh, when I did the statement of operations uh, video. And uh, what this refers to here is the value of all the physical stuff that the organization has um, that has a life more than one year. So up here in inventories, we're going to have stuff that we're simply going to expense, stuff like drugs, Band-Aids, so forth. Um, but there are things that the organization uh, uh, uses that it's not going to use up in the course of one year. So case in point is their building, right? So if, if this, is, this, is, this, this organization includes a hospital, so the hospital building itself isn't something that you're going to use up in one year. So it's not going to be a current asset, current assets, things that we're going to use or spend in one year. A building is not going to be used up in one year. In fact, the IRS says a building lasts uh, 39 years. Um, or at least that's how we're going to keep it on the uh, on the balance sheet. So this organization has uh, ninety million dollars in property, plant, and equipment stuff that uh, the organization considers uh, non-current, meaning it's going to last more than one year. Now it's net rather than gross because that net number includes accumulated depreciation. I don't have that number for this organization. Um, I gave a fairly lengthy description and explanation of, of depreciation in the income statement uh, video. So I suggest you check that out if you want to think about it or check out my video uh, for uh, chapter four uh, of Gapinski, uh, Gapinski's finan financial management, uh, healthcare financial management textbook. Um, but we, when we, when we purchase long lived assets, so for example, we purchase a building, um, a vehicle, uh, a Da Vinci robot, uh, an operating table, you know, all those things are expected to last more than one year. Um, and so we put those, those, the value of those things in the gross PPE line, the property, plant, and equipment. So we put all that under property, plant, and equipment. Um, and an important point is when we purchase something and we add it to our asset, um, our, our asset, the asset portion of our balance sheet, we add it and we keep it at um, historical cost. So if it cost us $50 million to build a building 20 years ago, and today it would cost us $100 million to build that same building, or even that building could be sold today for $100 million. That's actually a better way to think about it. That building could be sold today for $100 million because of its location and maybe the city's grown up around it, whereas it wasn't there before. 
we still carry the building at its original purchase price or its historical price of 50 million, even though it's actually worth 100 million. So property plant equipment reflects historical purchase prices of the equipment. Then, um, or, or to get net PPE, we accumulate depreciation. So we talked about depreciation, like I said, in the statement of operations. But each year we take a depreciation charge. So buildings last 39 years. So if we were going to do straight line depreciation, and there's a couple of different ways to do depreciation. We were going to do straight line depreciation, which means we just say, take the building and divide it by 39. So if it's a $39 million building, just to make my life easier, a $39 million building, it's going to last 39 years. We're going to take a depreciation charge of $1 million every year on the income statement um, that we have that building. After the first year, we'll have a $39 million gross PPE, right? Because that was the amount that it cost us to build the building. And then after the first year, we'll have accumulated depreciation of $1 million because that's the charge that we took on the income statement during the first year. And so when we net PPE, it's going to be 39 million minus 1 million. So the net PPE amount will be 38 million. Then in the second year, we'll take another million dollar depreciation charge and our accumulated depreciation will increase from 1 million to 2 million. And our net PPE will be 39 million minus 2 million for a net of 37 million. And that's how it rolls. And it keeps on going like that. So even if that $39 million building 20 years from now um, has a market value of $50 million, 20 years from now, we're going to have $39 million on the books as gross minus $20 million in accumulated depreciation for a net of $19 million in PPE, even though the building is, we could turn around and sell the building for $50 million. I want you to remember PPE is a historical number. It is carried at historical acquisition costs. Okay. Then we have other assets, random stuff here. And again, this is an aggregated uh, balance sheet, so it doesn't have as much detail. Um, but other assets, and so we total all the current assets plus all of the long-term assets, gives us $389 million and some change. So that's the asset side of the balance sheet. And now we're going to dive into right, the, how the organization is, essentially how the organization is financed, or you can think of you know, who owns or how the organization is owned. Um, so this is, this is where we get into uh, kind of you know, the, the example of like the mortgage versus the equity, right? So the first section of the liabilities and net assets section of the um, balance sheet is the liability section. And note that we start to talk about, so below this yellow line, we're now in the, the liabilities and net assets section. And note the first section of the liability section is current liabilities, just like we had up here, current assets. So current liabilities, like current assets, um, are our liabilities that we expect to uh, have to pay within a year. So for example, the first one, accounts payable. An account payable is a bill to your organization that you have to pay within uh, a reasonable amount of time, certainly within a year. So what that might look like is you have, a, you have an ongoing relationship uh, with a medical, uh, medical supply a vendor, and they ship you a box of uh, syringes. And that box of syringes costs $500. And so they ship you the $500, box of $500, and they say, uh, you know, here's your box of $500, $500 box of syringes, pay us within 30 days. And so that's a net 30 is what that's, that's referred to. Those are the terms, net 30 meaning we want, we want to be paid within 30 days. So if you had a $500, if, if, the, if the company shipped you a box of, a $500 box of syringes, your accounts payable would go up by $500. 
um, and you would carry it until you paid paid that bill. And when you paid the bill, then the accounts payable would go, go back down um, $500. Uh, and your cash would also go down $500. Uh, but, you know, like the um, example I used earlier of the tub, you know, for the accounts receivable, accounts payable works the same, it kind of works the same way. Um, <coughs> you are constantly buying uh, new supplies and other things on credit, and you are constantly paying off those those bills, and so it's just like the the water pouring into the tub with the drain open. So it's kind of water coming in, water going out, you know, from the spigot, water going out through the um, through the drain, and so your accounts payable level depends on how fast you know your bills are coming in and how fast your your cash is going out to pay off those bills. But an accounts payable is really just a just a you know it's your IOU uh, to a vendor. Accrued salaries and payroll taxes, I, I just call these accruals, um, uh, is uh, a, a slightly different, uh, or similar to a, accounts payable. Um, remember this: the the balance sheet is a snapshot in time. So let's imagine you're on a two week. Uh, uh, payroll cycle. So you get paid every two weeks. Well, imagine that December 31st of 2017 is on, um, is comes in the middle of your two week pay cycle. So you've already worked a week uh, for the organization, which the organization now owes you salary, right? Your, your pay for that week. But it's not going to pay you until next Friday, because the pay cycle is every two weeks. And so they have accrued an obligation to you of one week's pay. So that's basically what this is, is um, the, you know, the organization cut off um, uh, the balance sheet um, and had accrued at that point in time, $16 million in salaries. So that would vary depending on where the um, uh, where the year cut off uh, relative to the pay cycle. Next, uh, due to third-party payers. Uh, so this is money that you owe um, to third-party payers. You might have to reimburse somebody because they were over, overpaid, whatever it is. Uh, but it's just another, another bill. And then um, current portion of long-term debt. So this represents... Um, the current portion, meaning the amount of, of, of principal that you're going to pay back this year. So imagine you have a mortgage. Um, and let's see what, what I say here. Imagine you have a mortgage, a 30 year mortgage, um, and you're going to make payments on the mortgage that represent both principal and interest. Um, this is the principal portion, um, uh, uh, that you owe, uh, this year. So if you have a 30 year mortgage, as you know, um, if, if you're early in the mortgage, then most of your payments are actually um, interest. <clears throat> so let's imagine that five hundred thousand uh, dollar house again. You have a a, a thirty year uh, mortgage, and you're in your first year. You are going to probably pay back a few thousand dollars toward the principal, the five hundred thousand dollars, or what do we say, four hundred thousand dollar loan. So. Um, you know, so you're going to have, you're only going to pay, say, $10,000 back on the loan and you know, on the principal in the first year, and the rest of your payment just goes to interest. So if that were the case, you would have, if this was your balance sheet, you would have $10,000 here, right? And then the other 390000 would be down here in the long-term debt less current portion. So this would be the current, the portion of your long-term debt you're going to pay this year, and this is the rest of it. Um, okay. So we add all this up, and it becomes our total current liabilities, meaning that's the amount of money that the organization is expected to have to uh, come up with over the course of, of, of a year. But it's all the lia it represents all the liabilities, and many of these are kind of, you know, like I said, they're flow, and they're coming in and going out kind of continuously. And so there's kind of, it's more of a level rather than, a, than an absolute number.
Okay. So current liabilities for this organization is 37 million. And then we have some other, th other things. So once upon a time, they had uh, pensions, right? So they, pro they had some sort of uh, defined benefit pension. That's probably for some of the senior executives, maybe uh, also for people who uh, served in the organization um, before they switched over to a 401k defined contribution kind of uh, uh, of um, uh, 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 pension plan or, or or retirement plan rather. So these are liabilities, right? Because you owe these people that they've. This is deferred compensation, meaning they work for it. You promised them part of their compensation was hey, you know, when you retire, we will pay you X amount of dollars each year. Um, and we have long-term debt. Uh, this is um, uh, the amount of um, uh, uh, loans that they have out. So this, this, this particular organization has, has bonds, meaning these are, those are loans that you make uh, directly from the market. And so they have $49 million in long-term debt. Uh, the reserve for um, uh, liability claims, uh, this is kind of an estimate of how much they think they're going to owe uh, on, on professional liability claims at some point in the, in the future. And so then we add up the current liabilities plus all these other liabilities and we get total liabilities. And that is the, you know, using our, our, our house metaphor now, the the, the total assets, that's the market value of the house. This would be the mortgage on the house, if you will, because liabilities are things that are owed. Um, so this is, this is stuff owed to other people, um, uh, you know, essentially loans from other people in one shape or another. And then we get into equity, um, which is referred to as net assets for a not-for-profit. And we have 248 million in unrestricted assets, um, 1.1 million in temporarily restricted and 19 million in permanently restricted. Okay, so what does this mean? Well, this is primarily just an accounting um, uh, uh, to balance out the difference between uh, the liabilities and the total assets. So one, another way to look at this is to say, Total assets, 389 million, minus total liabilities, 119 million, has to equal total net assets. In the same way that when we said, well, the market value of a house is $500,000, they have a $400,000 mortgage, so their equity is 100,000. That's, that's essentially all this is saying. Now, the uniqueness here, well, there's three, you're saying, well, there's three different kinds of net assets. Okay, there are. Uh, you have temporarily restricted, which we talked about in the statement of operations. This is when somebody makes a donation to the organization. So say they make a donation. Here's $1,000 for the hospital. You can only use this money um, to uh, build a new, um, I think I used the example of cancer center. So here's my $1,000 towards building a new cancer center. So that $1,000 is restricted, it's temporarily restricted until such time as the organization actually builds a cancer center, at which point then it becomes, it, it, it converts to unrestricted and the organization uses it towards the cancer center. Um, or it's not unrestricted, but it's released from restrictions. Uh, and then permanently restricted is, here's some money, hospital, um, we want you to put it in, a, in an investment and you can spend the interest that you earn off of this money, but you can never spend the principal. That's what permanently restricted is. And then the balance here is, so we have 119 plus 19 plus 1.1, you know, would give us, um, would leave us with 248. And that's the balance, the unrestricted portion of our net assets. Uh, or our equity. Okay. Um, so that is, uh, oh, so then we add total net assets and total liabilities, and that gets us 389, which matches our total assets. Okay. 
So we've looked out now at the components, the kind of the broad components of the balance sheet. We've looked at kind of the, the nitty gritty individual lines here. Looking at, I want to look again, kind of like I did with the income statement. So if you're comfortable with year over year and common size already, then I'm not going to say anything new here, I don't think. Um, so um, when I do, when I start to do an analysis of, an, of a balance sheet or a financial statement, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of, you know, run my eyes down the, the two years that I've got. So I've got 2017 and 2016, and I'm looking for changes. So, for example, cash went from 34 million to 44 million. Well, that's a, that's a significant number, right? Like 10 million uh, on an organization with $389 million in assets, 10 million is, is a significant number. Uh, it is significant both kind of absolutely as well as in terms of a percent change, right? 30% is a big jump. Um, and, and it's a big jump on a big number. So, that's going to jump out at me. I'm going to be, okay, why, why did we jump from 34 million to 44 million in cash? Um, bearing in mind that cash doesn't earn me any interest. Um, why would we do that? You know, and so that's something I'd want to ask the management. Um, short-term investments, they brought short-term investments way down. They went from 14 to five, five. So probably a portion of the change in, uh, cash was simply a reallocation from short-term investments into cash. Um, so we'd want to ask managers, well, why did you decide to take money out of short-term investments where it was probably making some interest and put it into cash? And their answer might be, well, we're getting ready to make a, an important acquisition. We needed that cash to have that cash on hand. It's hard to say. Um, but, you know, 8 million is not an insignificant number and a 60% change is not an insignificant number. Um, so those kind of num those numbers which should, you know, jump out at you, right? 3.4% uh, change in allowance for doubtful accounts, well, you know, a million dollars is not that much to this organization. Uh, and 3.4% is not that big a deal. So you'd want to kind of scroll down and look at each of these kind of changes, looking for both big absolute changes as well as big percent changes. And, you know, let's see if we can scroll down here and find a, you know, like here is a 12% change. Well, that's a big percent, but it's only $700,000. So I'm not going to get super excited about that, right? So big percent change, relatively small, absolute change. Um, so uh, it's useful to look at this percent change to kind of start to generate questions, right? So you want to use the year over year change. Uh, to help you generate questions. All right. And then um, I do a common size balance sheet like I did in the statement of operations. I do a common size balance sheet. What I do here is I divide all of the entries in the column by total assets. So then everything is expressed as a percentage of the total assets number. So cash is 11% of the total assets. Uh, Short-term investments are 1.5% of the total assets. And so what's useful here is this gives me a kind of a, okay, what's the, you know, like, like I said in the other video, what's the, you know, kind of body fat um, uh, percentage uh, of the organization, right? So how is the organization uh, composed? Well, it's 11% cash. It's 40%, 7%, you know, investments limited to use. Um, and so, you know, 23% PPE. And then I also divide the bottom section by total assets. And, you know, or you could think of it as dividing it by total liabilities and net assets. It doesn't matter because it's the same number. Um, but we can say, okay, well, you know, um, uh, lia where we are 30% funded by liabilities and 70% roughly uh, funded by equity. So using our house metaphor before, right, I said they had a $400,000 uh, mortgage on a $500,000 house. In that case, they were 80%, <coughs> excuse me, they were 80% uh, funded by liabilities and 20% equity. So this organization is pretty conservative. Um, even by, uh, you know, by hospital standards, um, they have a relatively low uh, 
uh, uh, debt ratio, which we'll come to when we talk about ratios. So common size, it's useful to both kind of look at it um, to kind of get a sense of how the organization is structured, but also to look year over year and say, okay, well, how, where, where are the changes in per terms of percentage? Uh, and then common size is also useful for comparing you know, one organization to another organization because the absolute numbers are not going to be the same, right? Even if they're kind of this, kind of similar, um, you know, having this common size allows you to compare uh, more precisely. So, you know, if your organization has, um, you know, 30% uh, uh, of your organization is funded with liabilities and another organization is 40% funded with liabilities, well, now you've got something to think about. Like, should you maybe have a higher debt ratio? That's what that's called. Um, uh, or, or, or a lower debt ratio? Or is, is that a good ratio? It's, it, and whether it's good or bad kind of depends, right, on um, how are things changing as well as how do you compare to other organizations. So, all right. So that is the balance sheet. And next video, I will get into ratios.